Uh, good evening and welcome uh, here to Georgetown University. Welcome to Copley Formal Lounge, uh, this great ceremonial space we have on campus um, for this uh, continuation of the work that we've been undertaking this year with the Working Group on Slavery, Memory, and Reconciliation. Uh, my name is Matthew Carnes. I'm a professor of government uh, here at Georgetown. And I've been working in particular with one segment of our working group. It's a subcommittee uh, focusing on ethics and reconciliation. Uh, we've been charged by the larger working group to especially consider the ethical ramifications of Georgetown's uh, connection with uh, the practice of slaveholding, uh, Georgetown's connection to the sale of 1838, to think through the ethical ramifications of that, and especially to reflect on what reconciliation might look like. Um, it's a challenging topic. It's a topic that uh, ignites all sorts of different kinds of conversation, um, reflection on the deep meaning and the deep, the deep question of what does it look like to think about the cost that's been paid, the cost that's been borne by so many, and the burden that leaves then uh, for really making amends. What does that look like? So we've been reflecting on that in a deep way, and in these days, uh, we've tried to gather some voices that could speak to this uh, part of the conversation. And when we first started dreaming of people we could invite, uh, we especially thought of Professor Ed Baptist, a graduate of Georgetown, now professor of history um, at Cornell, Cornell University, who's looked specifically at the relationship of slaveholding and the making of the brand of capitalism that we have in the United States. Um, his work has been really pathbreaking, and we knew he was someone that could help us reflect in a deep way on these questions. So we're delighted he could make it. He had quite a journey getting here. Uh, his train got canceled at Penn Station. We were on the uh, phone throughout the afternoon. He generously made his way out to Newark Airport, made the last flight out of Newark, the first uh, taxi over, and he got here about 10 minutes ago. So we are delighted that he's made it here. Um. <laughs> Now, one of the real privileges of working on the working group has been being part of an interdisciplinary group of faculty and staff, and especially students. Um, and so to introduce uh, Professor Baptist, I'm going to ask one of the members of our working group to come forward. Uh, Connor Maitner is a junior here um, in the college. He's majoring in government and sociology. Uh, he's originally from the northwest suburbs of Chicago. Uh, he serves as a resident assistant in the spirit of Georgetown living and learning community, the community that is in the old Jesuit residence, uh, one of uh, which is buildings we've renamed this year as part of our reflection. He's also a senior advisor in the Georgetown Stu University Student Association, and he's our student representative on the board of directors. So he fills many roles here, but most importantly on our working group. And so Connor, please come forward to introduce Professor Baptist. Thank you, Father Carnes. Thank you all again for being with us this evening. It is my honor to introduce our featured guest tonight, Professor Edward Baptist. Professor Baptist is an associate professor of history at Cornell University in Ithaca, New York. A 1992 graduate of our very own School of Foreign Service, he went on to earn his PhD at the University of Pennsylvania. Professor Baptist's research focuses on the history of the 19th century United States, particularly on the history of the enslavement of African Americans in the South. An accomplished author, Professor Baptist's book titled The Half Has Never Been Told, Slavery and the Making of American Capitalism was published in the fall of 2014. The book explores the expansion of slavery in the United States in the decades following independence. Told with the aid of slave narratives, plantation records, newspapers, and the words of politicians, entrepreneurs, and escaped slaves, The Half Has Never Been Told offers a new understanding of American history as it probes the evolution and modernization of the United States. Now please join me along with the entire working group on slavery, memory, and reconciliation in welcoming back to the hilltop, Professor Edward Baptist. Thank you for uh, that generous introduction, and thanks to the entire uh, working group, um, especially Father Carnes, uh, for helping me to get here. Uh, took some improvisation, as they noted. Uh, and who knows, there may be some improvisation in this, uh, but we'll see. But, but um, I, I am really grateful to be invited back uh, to speak at my alma mater, particularly on this topic. 
Of course, on the rare occasions I'm invited back, well, anywhere, but uh, especially somewhere where I once studied and lived, I'm reminded of the book of Luke, chapter 4. Now, there's not much to compare between Jesus of Nazareth and I, uh, I must admit, and our wisdom and character and whatnot. Um, not even the beard and the hair. Uh, the paintings in the white people's Bibles are wrong. They're not accurate. Uh, but still, <clears throat> I'm in a sense coming back to my home synagogue, and I hope when you hear my message, you will not, to quote Luke the Gentile physician, you will not do like the people there. You will not be filled with rage, take me to the brow of the hill, uh, and threaten to throw me off. This is pretty steep up here. But I, I know when I talk about this book, I bring a message that is hard to hear. It's hard for me to hear. Uh, it's hard for, I think, uh, everybody to hear. Uh, and I, I do want to bring a message that in its own way counsels repentance and insists that we must continue to seek harder for justice, far harder than we've done in the United States or throughout Georgetown's history. And that includes reparative justice. But you're already hearing that message from many who are here, I think, and I come to add my voice to their much more deeply informed ones. I think we've seen uh, some of that in recent days, and we've certainly seen uh, Adam Rothman uh, front uh, kind of on point uh, with that. Uh, and uh, I know also Angie Mitchell, Maurice Jackson, Marcia Chatelaine, uh, the working group as a whole, uh, and a uh, president who, uh, from my perspective, has been far more active on this issue than most university uh, presidents. And above all, the students, the undergraduate students, uh, who forced this uh, into the light uh, and forced it to the front of the agenda here at Georgetown. It's actually, I, I could you know, joke about um, uh, people being filled with rage uh, against me as a speaker, but it's actually those who work and study here day in and day out who bear the burden and the threat and the risk, the very real risk of raising the challenge of truth. And that's true whether you're an undergraduate student uh, or a university president or anybody uh, in between in the hierarchy. I know there are different challenges and different risks, but um, nonetheless, it, it is risky. Uh, to raise that challenge, because it's risky to tell the truth of the story of the United States of slavery, uh, the story of slavery in the United States, even in 2016. The topic of slavery's injustices and what they mean today is the hardest one for the United States and the people living in it to handle, bar none. We've repeatedly killed people, um, hundreds of thousands at a time, uh, on at least one occasion, over slavery and its legacy. And repeatedly and continuously, white Americans in particular have made great wealth from slavery and its legacies. Assets stolen are only debts owed. Well, I believe that for us here in this room, faculty, students, staff, alumni like myself, community members, we can't escape history's judgment. The nature of our Georgetown community, and I recognize it's a different community for each of us, but the nature of that community its health, its success as an academic enterprise, and its success as an institution dedicated to something more than the growth of its endowment uh, and the rise in its average uh, SAT all depends on facing the facts of the past, acknowledging them, and making restitution. And in fact, I'd argue that even Georgetown's survival over the long run depends on how we respond to the judgment of history. Uh, universities, of course, are under new kinds of pressure today uh, and if they cannot give uh, what we might call an alibi for their being, uh, a special role that involves not just preparing people for job markets, but preparing them to be justice-seeking seeking human beings, uh, I, I think that universities are not uh, so long for this world. And Georgetown is one among many historically white colleges and universities, or HWCUs as I like to call them, whose histories are inextricably bound to wealth accumulated out of profit extracted from enslaved people's labor, profit collected from the sale of enslaved people's bodies, profit accumulated by the reproductive labor of enslaved people's families. And by that I mean the labor, uh, not just uh, in conceiving and bearing to term and giving birth, uh, but the labor done every day by the families uh, of children uh, and, and just family members in general. Um, to bring them up, uh, to raise them to adults. 
And all of that, all of that grown over time from inve in initial investments in the hothouse of a national economy powered for its first centuries by the fuel of slave labor, drawing investment from outside uh, by the collateral of enslaved bodies, spun up to high industrial velocity on ghost acres, as we might call them, uh, stolen from its uh, inhabitants and cultivated by the stolen, by the twice stolen, in fact, like the 272. And in fact, I think that unless American society as a whole faces judgment over this issue and makes just restitution, it will not only fail to become what it could be, it will ultimately collapse. For otherwise, all it will ever be is a morally unredeemed empire, and every empire falls far sooner than its rulers anticipate and unmourned by everyone else. Well, this message is not original to me. I did not discover it on my own. It comes to my mouth from sources far greater than me, including the best who are or who have been here at Georgetown, current faculty and administrators like those I, I mentioned, the students, uh, again, whose courageous activism is pushing the institution to re-examine its history. And what's good historical work in, in my book, which you see the cover of here, a lot of that comes from uh, the faculty who taught me here. Um, above all, my advisor, David Johnson, who doesn't teach here anymore but taught African history here. Uh, but also John McNeil, uh, among others who still teach here, uh, and still others who don't teach here anymore, like Marcus Redeker, Alan Karras, Mo Maru, uh, and several others. From uh, Maurice Jackson, who I worked with when he was just a grad student, uh, but he pushed me to do better and to be better, and for many of my fellow undergraduate Hoyas who did the same. And above all, I try, as I think we should, to listen for the voices of the 272 people who were sold as chattel, transported from all they loved, and resold to be sources of wealth from steel, still others. The wealth extracted from that process of stealing, I mean selling, but we should call it stealing because it was a process full of violence, even though it was 100% legal in 1838. That wealth, as I know you've been discussing, is all around us today. It has grown and multiplied until its present value reaches the dozens or even hundreds of millions, and every dollar of it speaks to rebuke us. All right, I wrote a book, uh, as I said, and the book was about the big picture, my attempt to give the big picture of this stealing. For this, what, what happened at Georgetown was only one piece of a massive puzzle. When my daughter was six months old, I started in the first preliminary ways to work on that book. Uh, in the book, which I researched and then wrote and rewrote over the many years to come, it wasn't published until she was 16. Uh, it was a long time. I sought to tell the story of the enormous project uh, and process over which it's 272 stolen founders of Georgetown were one small part. Uh, two, uh, 272 is a lot of people, but more than one million were moved from the old states to the new by force and they and their children were part of a process that depended in turn on the exploitation of all the millions of enslaved people in the U.S. And there were about four million slaves in the U.S. by 1860. In the book, I tried to do many things, but the central thing I tried to do was to tell the stories of people, uh, stolen people, uh, not as asterisks or exceptions in U.S. history, uh, for the sheer numbers alone meant that they could not be uh, exceptions. Um, or footnotes, uh, not as footnotes at all, but as the central characters. I don't necessarily mean getting behind their eyeballs and seeing everything as they saw, although we, we historians, we lie about it, but we always try to do that. Uh, but I mean writing a work of U.S. history in which enslaved people were the central subjects, in, in, in which the connections between them and political, economic, cultural, and demographic developments were the central story not just footnotes. And as I studied that, uh, my focus began to shift, or, or rather to broaden. It began to shift from social history and cultural history and microhistory, and those things were still part of it, um, but to look at uh, bigger questions, uh, bigger questions like the one implied by this, this picture, um, which is sort of jokingly called world economic history in one picture. And uh, th this is from the economist Gregory Clark, and it claims it's the world, but it's really probably just the West. Uh, but it, it shows something um, that uh, we historians all know happened, which is this takeoff of Western incomes, uh, this rapid transformation of economy, society, 
uh, and culture uh, that was clearly underway by the late 1700s and by uh, the middle 1800s was completely transforming uh, one after another uh, of the Western countries, Britain, uh, and then France, the U.S., et cetera, et cetera. How did this happen? Figuring out how this has happened uh, has been, uh, in many ways, the story of the study of modernization and modernity. This is one of the key questions which history as a scholarly discipline was invented to answer. How did human societies at that point in history achieve the miracle of sustained high growth rates and sustained technological change, which substantially increased productivity, the amount of goods and services that labor could make in a set amount of time? This had tremendous consequences uh, for those who came out as winners, uh, and one could argue there were more winners than before, uh, but it also had tremendous consequences uh, for those who ended up on the short end of uh, the new power relations that emerged from this. Well, we've got various explanations for this, <clears throat> this, this transformation, this great transformation. Uh, many have been offered. Uh, maybe uh, Western societies uh, were able to invent some key technologies which then begat other key technologies which then begat other key technologies. Maybe private property as a cultural and legal force was really first invented uh, in Britain uh, in the early 1700s, uh, and it enabled the right mix of incentives and control and strictures and rules uh, to let capitalism take off. Maybe Western societies have a specific cultural capacity for inventiveness. Um, maybe it was government policy. Now, most white historians have routinely rejected, often with what I can only describe as particularly ill grace, the Eric Williams thesis, which held that British gains from the Atlantic slave trade uh, and colonization, sugar colonization, in the Caribbean helped to lead to industrialization. Now, this is an ill grace impossible to separate from the racial politics of the academy. But even Williams and most of the other scholars who even began to breach uh, or broach the possibility that slavery could have made some contribution to the growth of this world transforming system in which we all live, modern capitalism, in most cases they had surprisingly little to say about cotton and this is strange. This would be like talking about 2016 capitalism with no reference to oil. Well, As I said, when I started my project I expected to find social history, cultural history, micro history, and I did find those things. Uh, but I didn't expect to find information that should have been, I think, found a long time ago, information that, for me at least, reshapes the story of how the West rose to dominate the world and how the U.S. became the world's most powerful capitalist economy. I found this information first in stories like that of Charles Thompson, and, and this is not him on the left, that's William Colbert, but this is the front page uh, of um, Tom, or the title page of Thompson's 1872 autobiography. He was born in slavery. Uh, he escaped. Uh, he published um, a narrative about his life. Uh, this is one of our uh, typical sources, um, I, I think, that we have to use when we study slavery in the 19th century South. There are about 100 of these uh, autobiographies. William Colbert represents another source, another kind of source which uh, I and many other slavery historians have used the 1930s WPA interviews done with surviving formerly enslaved people. Uh, there are about 2,200, 2,300 of them. And none of, these are, um, none of these are easy to read for a variety of reasons. Uh, the more clear uh, they are, the more harrowing the stories they tell. Uh, and then in other cases, uh, they're conceived as a kind of elaborate dance with a white interviewer uh, who cannot handle the truth. Um, and yet, in many cases, pieces of the truth, I think, are, are offered. Well, Charles Thompson uh, was born in Atala County, Mississippi in the year 1833. And he didn't know it at, at the time, but he was born uh, on a frontier. Uh, Atala was the edge of cotton country, which in Mississippi was being marched inland from the river, which is to the west of Atala. Into the territory, Andrew Jackson's administration was extracting from its Choctaw and Chickasaw owners. And he was also uh, born on a, a chronological frontier. By 1833, the commercial production of cotton had been driving American expansion into the Mississippi Valley for 40 years, and the drive was accelerating. American cotton had come from nowhere to dominate the world market for cotton. 
And the commodity, that commodity market was growing just as fast as the industrial textile factory sector that cotton fed. And that industrial textile factory sector, factory sector was what more than any other sector of the British economy was driving that curve upward. And that graph uh, I just showed you, that, that sector uh, was the origin point, uh, most scholars would agree, of the Industrial Revolution. And cotton, of course, came from the fields in which Charles Thompson was destined uh, to toil. Now, as the factory system emerged, raw cotton was becoming the most in-demand commodity on the world market. Southern enslavers, uh, by 1833, the year of Thompson's birth, had been able to seize control uh, of its most profitable import markets. But if cotton entrepreneurs could not continue to supply the ever-growing demand for that commodity in ever-growing quantity, it was possible that prices would rise uh, and the commodity would turn into a cord that would choke off further growth. So Charles Thompson, as he came into the world, well, dynamic systems were churning uh, around him. These classic shifts we've been trying uh, to explain uh, ever since were churning all around him. The next few years in his life were eventful, uh, and not just for him personally, uh, but for the South uh, and, and the U.S. in general. Uh, as the economy, the cotton economy expanded rapidly, credit was pumped in from world financial markets, over 250,000 enslaved people were moved from older states like Maryland, Virginia, D.C., and so on, moved into the deeper south, put primarily into the cotton fields, a few into the sugar fields, and cotton production actually doubled in the course of that decade. Lots of financial bets had been made on cotton. Lots of uh, people had incurred debts based on the expectation of high cotton prices when the market uh, couldn't support uh, that supply, when it had outpaced supply, uh, then the result was financial crisis. There were two of them, in fact, 1837 and 1839. And after the second one, Thompson's enslaver died, uh, and his family was split up. Um, he was uh, sold to one place, his mother to another, and his father to a third. And so at the age of, of 10, um, he found himself... In, in the early 1840s in a new place in Pontotoc County, Mississippi, uh, at one of the two or three key crossroads of an enslaved person's life on the frontier where the world's most widely traded commodity was being made. And that was the first moment when he went into a cotton field. A young or old, Mississippi-born or migrant from the old states, that moment uh, was a moment when many people remember they learned some new truths about what it was like to be enslaved. People brought from the old states who had a comparison to make reported that the work was more intense in the new ones, the whip was bigger and cut more deeply, and that enslavers deployed it more rapidly. Even Thompson, uh, who was born on the Mississippi frontier, still had to learn new things. And the thing that was always new was that he wouldn't be able to stop learning or actually reinventing himself. And let me explain what I mean by that. So after the invention of the cotton gin, we all know about the cotton gin, 1791, solves the processing bottleneck. Cotton picking becomes the bottleneck in the process of producing this key industrial commodity. People could plant and cultivate more cotton they could, than they could pick from the rows and acres of bushes before the harvest had to end because the frost had turned the remaining fibers brown. So enslavers, Thompson found, pushed enslaved people to pick as fast as they could all day long. Here we have one of our earliest photos of uh, people picking cotton uh, from the 1860s, actually. Uh, and here late in the day, we have them bringing their individual baskets of cotton back uh, to the center uh, of the slave labor camp to be weighed. Uh, it was weighed and then written down on a slate uh, or sometimes immediately onto a ledger, ultimately it was uh, transferred into a ledger that listed everybody's individual picking for the day. And the amount that they picked um, became an individual requirement. It wasn't the same for everybody. Each picker had a stint or daily task to perform, Thompson recalled. That is, each of them was required to pick so many pounds of cotton, and when in default, they were unmercifully whipped. And Thompson actually got the job of helping to weigh the cotton, so he was right uh, in the middle uh, of the entire process. That was good. He wasn't very good at picking cotton himself. Uh, but certainly the task of those who had to pick it was much harder. Uh, the, they had their individual tasks, uh, which were normed to what they were thought to be able to pick. Uh, but 
Uh, here, if it was like other places, individuals' stints increased over time. Enslaved people like John Brown found that as I picked so well at first when he was given a 100-pound stint, more was exacted of me, and if I flagged a minute, the whip was liberally applied to keep me up to the mark. By being driven in this way, I at last got to pick 160. And if you think about this increase in the size of the stint, I think you'll be able to understand, if you haven't already, many facts of which historians have taken an extraordinarily long time to make full sense. Um, and perhaps we still haven't. Uh, but here are some of those facts. Um, the fact that enslavers weighed cotton every day, that they recorded how much was picked, that they ledgered it carefully, uh, that they did not let them stop till dark, rather than setting a production quota as a sort of positive incentive after which they could, uh, enslaved pickers could perhaps um, stop. Uh, or the fact uh, that if you've read 12 Years a Slave or if you've seen the film, which reproduces this story pretty well, Patsy, who's the fastest cotton picker, was whipped. Uh, and in fact, she was whipped sometimes for not picking enough cotton. Now, various survivors, um, I went through their narratives and uh, recorded what they said were, were quotas or expectations. Uh, and that gave me a, a good view of a system in which requirements were being raised over time. And then a couple of uh, economists, historical economists, got a, a very nice series of daily weigh-ins from those ledgers I talked about before. And they showed, analyzing tens of thousands of daily weigh-ins from thousands of different cotton pickers over 60 years, that with each passing year from 1800 to 1860, the average enslaved person picked 2% more cotton per workday, which compounds to a 400% productivity or efficiency increase over six decades. Instead of rising to choke off growth, the world's most essential and widely traded commodity plummeted in price even as supply rose, dropping by 1860 to 25% of its inflation-adjusted price back in 1800. Supply rose faster than demand, and the U.S. made cotton far more efficiently than other countries which, with access to the same seeds and the same machinery, simply couldn't compete. By the 1830s, U.S. cotton was about 90% of all the cotton sold in Europe's industrializing economies. If cotton was oil, the U.S. South was Saudi Arabia plus Kuwait plus Iraq plus Iran plus Libya plus the UAE plus Nigeria plus Russia plus Venezuela. We could go on. Low-priced, abundant raw materials allowed factory owners in Britain and Massachusetts, and you can see the cotton being shipped out from New Orleans here, allowed these factory owners to invest the cost savings generated by calibrated torture, uh, because of course if you didn't pick enough you were whipped, and sometimes it was calibrated not just by the ledger but so precisely that if you were four pounds short you would get four lashes and so on. They invested the profits in ever more efficient machines, and consumers meanwhile benefited from the ever cheaper cloth the factories pumped out. I even suspect that a good portion of the system of fashion as we know it today grew in no small part as a solution to the problem of cotton oversupply created by the whip-driven efficiency of enslaved African-American stolen labor combined with the machine-driven efficiency of the factories. Consumers had to be convinced to buy more clothes, to throw away old clothes or put them uh, aside as out of fashion sooner and sooner and sooner. People had to be convinced to wear different clothes every single day rather than wearing your work clothes all week long. Everybody benefited except those who made the cotton. Now those who made the cotton were tortured to make it ever more efficiently. Uh, and that's how their creativity was stolen, their days and years were stolen, uh, their survival was stolen with that hanging over them. Uh, the things they did uh, in order to survive uh, only uh, raised the quotas they would be expected to pick in the future. And they and all their children and brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers and wives and husbands and friends and lovers, because of this revenue producing capacity, they were all accounted as marketable wealth. And it's in that vein that we should discuss the 272 people sold to Louisiana, to the New Orleans slave market in order to keep Georgetown afloat. They are why we are here. And how should we account for them? There's no price, of course, that can do so as Adam Rothman justly said yesterday. But it remains true that the financial returns from that sale have been very lucrative over the years. How lucrative? 
Well, when newspaper stories try to interpret their value to Georgetown today, the 272 are often given a monetary value equal to the inflation-adjusted 2016 equivalent of their 1838 sale price, three million or four million, for instance. Now, in this era, our own era, many of us are finally learning, sometimes with the help of Thomas Piketty, uh, sometimes through harder kinds of experience, even harder than reading an 800-page book. Um, <laughs> Many of us are finally learning what the wealthy already know about wealth, uh, which is wealth is revenue, profit, income, accumulated over time and stored in many forms so that it grows of its own accord. Often faster, as Piketty reminds us, than the growth of the economy as a whole. University endowments are vast collections of wealth that represent the invested savings of donors and others which have uh, in turn grown with but faster than the economy. Wealth grows over time, is invested in many ways, it has grown over time here at Georgetown. It may very well be that the university would not exist at all without this sale of people, but even if Georgetown had been flush when it made the sale, it would have invested the revenue in some way or other, even if not in a life preserver. Uh, in buildings, faculty salary, financial aid, stocks, bonds, it doesn't matter. All are financial choices that generate returns. And these can be hard or impossible to price with precision, especially since this particular financial choice yielded not just revenue but survival. But one handy yardstick would be to simply price the monetary value of the revenue from the sale of 272 enslaved men, women, and children by what that revenue would have earned as a cash investment. And we're told the sale was made for about 115000 I believe. And even at a fairly basic level of a 4% average return over time, the growth till today will yield, I think, $123 million. What if Georgetown had bought all the rest of the land in the neighborhood of Georgetown? What would that cost today? What would it have cost then? I think they could have got it for $115,000. Um, but what would it cost today? Think about it and you'll see that I am by no means exaggerating the 2016 value of this addition to the endowment. Well, the New York Times, just to give you some context, said on Sunday that this was no ordinary slave sale, but actually it was. The sale was possible because it was ordinary. It was profitable because it was ordinary, because these things happened all the time. The slave market in the U.S. was extensive, regular, and among the most reliable generators of profitable investment in the Western world. We historians have documented this and continue to document and debate uh, the implications of this. But the domestic trade encompassed by 1865 as many as two million people bought or sold across the South with somewhere between half and one million taking the route from the upper South to the deeper South, like, like the folks sold from the plantations in Maryland to Louisiana. Prices for slaves in the New Orleans market were high, often exceeding $1,000 in 1800s money for a young man. Uh, and they and that represents as much as 100 months of full-time labor by a wage, a free wage labor, or well over $200,000 in 2016. If you want a really good fix on what a slave price is, I think that's the best way to convert it. Prices were high because slavery was profitable, but also because slavery and the slave trade were protected by law. And the U.S. federal, state, and local governments cooperated with a broad consent of virtually all whites in the country to force enslaved people to stay enslaved. The army, the militia, the courts punished revolt with mass execution. The same groups of people rounded up runaways. Courts and Congress and the Constitution guarded the legality of the interstate slave trade. Abolitionists criticized it, but to no avail. Trade continued growing in size and value decade after decade. These same forces reliably, ins re reliably ensured that enslaved people were treated as property, that one could sell them, could hold them, and prove title, mortgage them that investors could collect slices of the revenue they generated by work or reproduction, that they could be insured against loss, that the government would protect the rights of property holders against theft and false, false claim. And the law of the U.S., they were property in virtually all the senses necessary for building a vibrant capitalist economy. And in fact, they were better than most property for those purposes, and not just because, again, they produced a tremendous return uh, through their torture-driven labor in the field. Uh, they were highly liquid property. They were the most liquid property in the U.S. in the sense that there was a massive, reliable market for this property. There were few, if any, years when one could not obtain a price from the slave market. And by the 1820s, there were professional slave traders who would make the process easy for people who wanted to buy or institutions who wanted to sell. 
All these facts about the wealth and slaves need to be remembered. And no wonder that in the pre-Civil War years, from 1789 to 1861, enslaved human beings typically accounted for 15 to 20 percent of all the accounting wealth in the country. That's more than all the stocks, bonds, cash, and factories. The only thing bigger on the balance sheet of the U.S. is land, and much of that land was not sellable. Land could not be forced to march to a more profitable market and more profitable production zones. And consequently, it was easier, far easier to get a loan on a slave than on an acre of land, unless, of course, it was land to which slaves could be brought and work profitably. And the U.S. government is part of this at this sort of meta level as well, working hard to add value to the investments of all those invested in slavery by conquering an empire of land for slaveholders' entrepreneurial projects, conquering it from uh, its previous inhabitants. And there's much we could say about the ways in which the system of slavery uh, extracts uh, the reproductive labor uh, I talked about um, before. But the point here is that the growth of property value was accomplished by exploiting and stealing the love of enslaved African Americans for each other and for themselves. Cashing that in, cashing the product of that love in through sale in the slave market meant destruction of those bonds and the riveting of new ones. Uh, on the people who were thus sold. The destruction of families meant the creation of slave markets and financial markets, the creation of opportunities for expanding entrepreneurial cotton and sugar products, opportunities for saving educational institutions. And it wasn't just slave sellers, slave buyers, and cotton planters who benefited. In addition to what consumers got, every person in the West who benefited from 19, uh, 19th century financial markets benefited. Uh, collateral. Uh, enslaved people in the southern U.S. were among the best collateral in the Western world. It attracted investors. The system attracted investors uh, from all over the world. In the 1830s, they pumped tens of millions of dollars into a scheme of bonds which resembles nothing so much as residential mortgage bonds uh, here in the U.S. Uh, with some similar financial effects, uh, similarly explosive effects, and then they came back for more. In the 1850s, virtually every dollar of value, book value, of, of enslaved people in Louisiana was mortgaged at least once. At 6 to 8 percent return for many of the loans, this meant that value was transported out of the slave south and around the world. That wealth grew and transformed economies and was inherited in the form of estates that were passed on uh, and grew again. And none of this was possible without the connivance of governments in ensuring that enslaved African Americans would be, in the U.S. context, a uniquely exploitable category of person and property. None of this was possible without another kind of connivance uh, as well, which I, I think I implied before, where I talked about the system of extracting cotton uh, through measurement uh, and torture. That's a system which depends upon the assumption, and not just the assumption of those who are enacting it, but those who let it persist, i.e., everybody else in the U.S., that efficiency trumps morality, that efficiency trumps morality. Getting more product in the same amount of time from the same amount of labor is worth moral compromise. Uh, and so white Americans were willing uh, to let Charles Thompson uh, or Patsy or anyone endure any kind of management that allowed unprecedented economic growth uh, to continue. And so the efficiency of cotton uh, picking grew uh, by 2% per year for what may have been the most crucial 60 years of Western society's transition from subsistence agricultural to high growth modern economies. And we like to think that this industrialization uh, process uh, was produced by clever inventors, factory workers, and captains of industry, but American cotton made by slaves was the key raw material. Uh, of that industry. And millions of people were moved to slavery's frontiers. They were exploited in multiple ways by financial markets uh, and by enslavers and by cotton markets. Uh, and again and again, they were driven to produce that cotton uh, ever more cheaply. The result was not just a plummeting price of cotton, uh, not just massive human suffering, but investments in new products that went beyond textiles or financial markets. Uh, and the accumulation of massive concentrations of wealth that are still with us. And refusal to admit the consequences of those processes is a long-standing issue. It's a long-standing issue, and there are many 
uh, arguments uh, that, that uh, I have heard that claim that this efficiency, which produced a radical break uh, in the way that products were produced up and down the commodity chain, which was the driving one at the center of the Industrial Revolution, that somehow that, uh, that system of labor at the bottom, that's the bottom gear of that process, that somehow it's not relevant to the changes that were happening uh, everywhere else. Or people say, yes, but perhaps um, these economic transformations could have happened without uh, that kind of slavery, and that kind of expansion and intensification of slavery. Well, there may be an alternate universe in which that did happen, but that's not the one we live in. That is not the one we live in. Enslaved people were tortured to make wealth. They were exploited as wealth, and they were exploited through markets which priced that torture, ultimately. And that gets me to the point where we can come back, I think, pretty concretely to, to 272 and the relationship to 4 million. All of the slaves sold from 1789 to 1838 and that were anticipated you know, to be sold uh, afterwards, they made a price uh, in this ephemeral thing called the market. They made a price against their wills for Georgetown's human property and Georgetown profit in 1838. All of the enslaved people who raised those enslaved people made it possible to set a price. They made it possible against their wills to set a price for Georgetown's exploitation in 1838. All the enslaved people who labored in those years, who labored in those years and on whose labor buyers and investors could reasonably count on exploiting Yes, they are part of this story, too. To restrict our thinking about our university's responsibilities to only the specific descendants of 272 specific people is something like suggesting that Georgetown's financial aid resources should only be available to military veterans who are descended from alums and not all veterans. There's a bigger system. There's a bigger system that makes the, po the participation of veterans, uh, for instance, possible and gives them a legitimate claim on financial aid resources. And likewise, there was a bigger system of which Georgetown took advantage. All enslaved people in the U.S. were exploited by Georgetown's participation in the market. And if we consider that on the particular scale, the particular scale, Georgetown owes a debt that can in some ways be priced by either its survival, which is kind of the big, you know, the big price, or a sum of money derived from the investment that sale has permitted since 1838. I would still argue that all who are descended from enslaved African Americans hold a share of the unpaid debt, not just descendants of the 272, although they certainly do. Well, we have connived at not repaying in this country for too long in every sense, and there are all kinds of excuses for not doing so. In fact, to investigate all the excuses would be to tell a whole long story, uh, history of white racism in the United States. Slavery wasn't profitable. Slavery wasn't good for black folks. Black folks would waste the, uh, waste the money. Most of the money is gone. No living person benefited from slavery. The last point is nonsense, particularly as if wealth was not inherited from generation to generation, as if investments shrunk rather than multiplying many times in value over the last two centuries since 1838. And if investments grow, think of what happens to unpaid debts. I guarantee you pay a higher um, rate on your mortgage loan than you get on your savings account. Debts only grow faster over time, and in many ways, slavery's debt has only grown over time. It is bigger now than it has ever been. It gets bigger every single day we wait to start redeeming our debts. The debt for the nation seems enormous beyond measure. Not even a uh, Vermont socialist with wild hair can um, think of discussing it as a, as a uh, possibility in, in public policy. Um, it seems beyond measure, and surely it is beyond measure in the moral and spiritual sense, perhaps even in the financial sense. But here at Georgetown, we have an opportunity to address a specific harm that was committed by our institution's agents for the benefit of this institution, a benefit whose value over time has grown exponentially, um, a, a harm from which I have benefited uh, and many other people in this room. Not all aspects of that harm can be addressed financially, not even the greater portion. Not all the harm can be addressed, I'm sure, by human actions, and certainly not by the kinds of which I could provide uh, any accounting. And I even grow skeptical about, um, and, and not to um, 
cast shadow on the, the work of, of the, uh, the committee, but I even grow skeptical about reconciliation as, as a goal that seems like something far down the road um, and that has to be achieved through different processes. But I recognize the will is good. But ultimately, the way I see it is that there's justice and truth on one hand and denial and injustice on the other. And even if the justice and the truth is incomplete, uh, it seems that the choice is pretty plain. Here at Georgetown, we've used that money for over 178 years. And at the very least, we must put it back. Those who deserve it are those denied their inheritance by slavery and its legacies. And therefore, as one Georgetown alum, no more, no less than that, I call for the establishment of a fund in the university endowment to the amount of the 1838 value of the sale of 272 men, women, and children to Louisiana, multiplied by a reasonable annual return on that money to the date of the full and complete establishment of that fund. So in other words, not till April 20 or 19 or whatever day this is, 2016, but the day when the fund is fully vested. I suspect that could not be less than 100 million. The return from that endowment, I would propose, would be used to pay the full cost of attendance, descend, for, of attendance for students descended from Africans enslaved in the United States for the reasons I just explained above. And I would suggest Georgetown allocate those scholarships with both merit and financial need in mind. Uh, and I, for my own part, as just one alum, would, should that become a, a possibility, I would insist that this money not be taken from financial aid that's already in play, that's already in use. That the 100 students, uh, if, if that is the number that can be funded um, per year, um, that they be 100 students who would not otherwise uh, be attending Georgetown. Uh, and so that the number uh, of students descended um, from not just the 272 people who were sold by Georgetown, but all of the people affected um, by the market that that sale helped to sustain and draw profit from, that, that their number be increased um, by this process, their number here at Georgetown. I'm just one alum, uh, one only, uh, but I believe that this is what that which is best uh, has taught me to say. And the Georgetown uh, that would do this is the best Georgetown. And that's the Georgetown that seeks knowledge in order to do justice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Baptist, for, for that incredible talk. Um, so we're now going to transition into a brief moderated discussion. Um, so I'd like to take a moment to introduce our moderator to you all. Maurice Jackson is an associate professor of history here at Georgetown, a 2009 inductee into the Washington, D.C. Hall of Fame. He was appointed by the mayor and the Washington, D.C. City Council to serve as the first chair of the D.C. Commission on African American Affairs. He is also a member of the Working Group on memory, rec me Slavery, Memory, and Reconciliation. Please join me in welcoming Professor Maurice Jackson. Uh, 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 thank you, Connor. Uh, and uh, uh, thank you for coming, uh, Ed. As, as, as they say from where I'm from, you did good. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, and I'm sure that the, uh, you've made a proposal that the working group uh, uh, discuss, would discuss. I'm, I have two degrees from Georgetown, so I'm, as I say, I'm with you, but we'll see. It, it, it would cost about what, uh, what it costs to build a new athletic center. Mm -hmm. Maybe a little, maybe a little more. So anyway, <laughs> what the key farmers say, a million, a million, a million here, a million there, pretty soon you're talking about real money. <laughs> at, at any rate, uh, uh, many questions come to my mind, and, and I'll just ask a few, and, and then I'll get out of the way. Uh, as, a, as a very young man, uh, uh, I was sent down south, and, and the school burned down, or where I was, and so they gave us all mimeograph sheets of paper to read from. And one of them has something, and I've remembered it, and I've read it many times. I've read the whole book, but, but it, it goes like this. And it was from uh, uh, Karl Marx's uh, Das Kapital. Capitalism came dripping from head to foot from every pore with blood and dirt. 
I look at this picture and I look at what you've uh, read and I've you know, read the book a couple of times and, and you've given that example. But, 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 but what stands out to me is that you've demystified the myth that somehow northern capital and southern slavery was so distant that, uh, that the nation as a whole didn't benefit from slavery, that only the South did, that it was only an institution that, that was uh, a part of the South and that uh, uh, the South had this separate uh, economy as different as feudalism from capitalism. And uh, to go into that a little bit more, uh, uh, how, uh, how in fact uh, the nation as a whole, especially Northern industrialists, benefited from this tragic institution. Yeah. Well, specifically, the uh, um, connection is very, very tight because perhaps even more than the case of British industrialization, Northern industrialization, industrialization starts with cotton textile factories that are 100 percent dependent not just on raw materials from the south but on making a relatively low quality product which was then sold to the south specifically to be used by enslaved people uh, so-called negro cloth uh, who were too busy working in the cotton fields the sugar fields and other endeavors to spin and weave their own cloth which they would wear. And so they are a literally captive market, protected by tariff policy, right? Uh, protected by tariff policy, sustained by the labor, um, uh, uh, tariff policy protects the industry that's sustained by the labor of enslaved African Americans and, of course, the first group of industrial wage workers in the U.S. And as happened in Britain, but again, I think even more concretely in the U.S., other industries spun out of the textile industry. The machine tool industry uh, is created uh, by people who learn their chops fixing the machines in the cotton mills, right? Uh, the machine tool industry then becomes the farm tool industry, which is used to help open up still more land for cotton for other endeavors as well. Uh, but pretty soon, um, axes and hoes and so on made in Connecticut, uh, replacing the ones made in Britain. So there's a very tight connection there. There's also the connection in, in that 50 percent of U.S. exports are raw cotton year after year from 1820 to 1860. In fact, cotton is still the number one export even after the Civil War. It's not 50 percent of all value anymore. But that in an economy that's desperate for foreign cash to be imported, right, uh, and foreign credit to be imported uh, to make its connection uh, as an importing, uh, as, as a society that has to import a whole lot and has to export a lot of raw materials to pay for that. To make that connection work, the U.S. economy depends uh, on, on cotton and also on investment from overseas in slave purchases. And that's not always, it's rarely direct, right? right. But it's, it's very clear that they, they work through the mediaries of banks and merchants uh, to send credit into the South, which then become slave purchases. So um, all of that helps benefit and grow and increase the growth rate of the Northern economy. But specifically, to get back to the point of Marx, I mean, the critique, you know, I would make of at least how some of Red marks is that slavery is the, the pedestal on which capital is erected. But the slavery that takes place in the 19th century South, and I think not just in the 19th century South, I think you see it in 19th century Cuba and Brazil for sure, is something that is so closely tied to the market uh, and takes on as many of the values of the market as do the, you know, the factory owners, different values of the market, the values of the market, you know, they, they pick a different set, but the values of the market are all the same. Uh, you can't tell them apart, you can't tell these entrepreneurs apart from the capitalists that we, that we understand as capitalists, the industrial capitalists, you know, they are thinking with the market all the time, they're acting in concert with the market, they're converting people into things with great regularity and the things into money and so on and so forth. So. Um, they're, they're capitalists, and even the production that takes place on the factory floor on the one hand and in the cotton field on the other 
is not that different. In the 19th century, there's constant pressure uh, driven by the close connection between world markets, right, and new values with the labor process. Constant pressure in the cotton fields to speed up. I was whipped up to the pace. And soon I got to pick 170. His efficiency as a laborer nearly doubled. It took 60 years for American slaves to increase their efficiency of cotton picking 400%. It took 40 years. These are 40 years we know because we've got them measured um, in some history of the textile uh, world. Um, it took 40 years for British spinners who take that cotton and turn it into thread, right? So they can be then woven through mechanical looms. They're using machines, but it takes them 40 years to increase their efficiency of labor 500, 600%. They're in the same order of magnitude. You, you know, you, you, thank you. you. You talk about the development of the, uh, uh, of the cotton gin and while it, 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 it increased, it, it, you know, productive in one hand, it didn't pick the cotton, it didn't take the seeds. But, but in one section, and, and there are many beautiful sections of the book, one section that, 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 that I particularly like is, is well, like, uh, uh, that is Bob, you talk about the pushing system. This is the, the drive for more profits, the drive for more, uh, 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 the accumulation of capital. But as you talk about the pushing system, the, the, to make a person go beyond what is reasonable to go, at the other hand, you talk about Petsy. And Petsy is a woman who has, has learned to, to pick cotton so efficiently. And somewhere you compare it to a, to a pianist, and I think man, as you play the piano, you play in one hand, you play in one tune. I don't know if anybody saw the new, new move on Nina Simone. And uh, not, not the new one with uh, Saldano, not that one. You stay home. <laughs> don't see that one. <laughs> the documentary. Huh? The documentary. The documentary. What happened, Miss Simone? What happened, Miss Simone? And you yeah. see her playing, and you can tell she's a genius. Because mm -hmm. she's playing one tune in one hand, singing, and another tune in another hand. As I saw that, I thought of Earl Gunn, but I also saw a Patsy. Here's a woman who has, she hadn't conquered the system, because she could, but she has figured out something. She's figured out a way to freedom. Mm -hmm. And you tell many stories about that, and, and I would like for you to just, just give example of how slaves, even with, the, and you speak of all type of violence things, many figured out a way to try to beat this, because as you start in the book, you say that 10% of all slaves on continental slave ships involved in some type of mutiny, some type of rebellion. So here you're talking about day-to-day -day resistance, and I think often we don't hear enough about it. So why don't you tell us a bit about how Pessy and others figured this out? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> it seems to me from talking to people who picked cotton in the 40s and 50s and then also reading what's in the accounts, uh, that as the demands got higher, uh, it became imperative for many people, if they wanted to meet the demands, to pick with two hands and to pick with two hands independently. This is really, really hard to do. Most people are not really ambidextrous. Most people can't learn to play the piano as well as Nina Simone. I don't believe. I think. No, she's a genius. Yeah. You know. Bonafide. Lots of people can learn to play the piano That's right. if they put the effort into it. But, but I think there are levels that, you know, just are not going to be reached by, by many people at all. And. Of course, it's really complicated. If you've got a patsy uh, out there in the cotton field and she's picking 500 pounds a day and most people are struggling to pick 200 pounds, uh, then she's got a kind of complicated relationship to other people right, right. Uh, there. Now, they've got, their individual, um, they've got their individual quotas and they're struggling to meet them. I have no doubt that, that they would look at somebody like a patsy and try to pick up a couple of her tricks. Of course, that just doesn't end the constant demand for, for higher and higher production. She's right. suffering from that as well. But it's uh, the cotton picking in, in many of the accounts, is, it's referred to as what I would interpret as a dissociative experience, right? And I've had, I've had to do this kind of work before, you know, where, where your mind just has to go somewhere else because it's so incredibly boring and physically kind of hard. Um, but, you know, the extent of time for which Patsy had to do it uh, is quite different, obviously. Um, and 
to go into that dissociative place, but at the same time know that you're doing something that's elegant and amazing. Right. Nobody can do it. Nobody, but you can do that. That's creativity, right? It's creativity, but it's creativity that is stolen completely, right? right? And ultimately held against her. You know, she's held up against it um, and uh, found wanting when she doesn't pick that much. So it's, it's very, um, I mean, in a way, it, that's, that's a metaphor for a whole lot of artists' creative experience. Right. Again, it's not necessarily slavery, but um, the kinds of exploitation we've had with, of artistic creativity in this country, right. particularly of African Americans. It's, it's, in a sense, it's a replicated pattern. You know, cotton picking, playing music, these are different right. things. I acknowledge that. Exactly. But the, the will to exploit Right, yeah. that is that is there in the dominant society in both cases. Day-to-day um, -day resistance, like running away, is of course everywhere. Right, but um, it's something that I, I talk about. But I'm now working on a, a new project that focuses on runaways. Uh, and uh, Adam Rothman's on the board of this uh, um, project that um, uh, I'm working on with a couple other scholars to try to collect all the runaway slave ads in one database. And I know he, he got uh, some of his students to run through our, our pilot version. Mm -hmm. and it's, I think it's really a powerful experience for students to encounter those in the role of a historian, right? <clears throat> you're trying to make sure nothing is missed from this document, and you're trying to read into it and uh, and, and see whether or not there's something you think of as resistance going on there. Uh, so I, I think that's very, um, that's a very exciting project for me to talk about. Um, I won't go too far off on that. Yeah. And, and lastly, before I, I turn over, <laughs> this piece, you go into great depths about, about violence. There's the violence of Potter, who I think his name is Potter, who, who, who kills this who castrates his wife's lovers. There's the violence of a, of, of, of a man who takes his, a, a woman from, t takes a young girl who's 15. Uh, uh, there's the violence uh, of inventing new type whips, which I didn't know. You invent a new whip to whip somebody harder to make them work harder. Uh, uh, there's the violence of men against their wives. Uh, 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 there's the violence of, of, of people against, against, uh, 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 against the word of God, the spiritual, you know, uh, the religious code. And, and everywhere, it, it existed at a certain point that how in the world did a people, how in the world were white people able to survive with all this violence and believe that such a system was right? What kept that together? You, you, you speak about it, but, it, but it's something there that, it's something even more than prophets there. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <clears throat> well, I think that, um, you know, at least for some of the white actors in the system, uh, the ones who can't keep all those realities at distance, right? If you're in Britain and you want to buy a bond that's going to let you profit at 6% per year on a slave mortgage, you know, it's relatively easy. And you know we're involved in these kind of relationships ourselves, you know, in our own economic lives, directly or indirectly. It's it's almost impossible to stay out of them mm. uh, in the modern economy. But for those who are right there and right close, you know, as as you say, there are tests, uh, and some Southern enslavers, if you will, fail them, mm -hmm. right? And they try to reform the system. They're they're not they're not up to being, you know. That, that sort of full-line character of the system. Or in a few, a few, very few cases, they become abolitionists. And I think there are some of the more, you know, radical uh, and perceptive white abolitionists that there are in some cases, certainly the Grimke sisters, for instance. Mm -hmm. but, but I think we also have to recognize that the violence is not a bug of the system, it's a feature. Mm -hmm. It binds it binds actors to the system. It commits them to doing more violence to prove that the violence is just 
has always been just. And it becomes, I think, one of the attractions of the system, just as rape becomes one of the attractions of the system, just as rape drives, it's one of the factors that drives prices, right? And, and there are numerous reasons to think that it drives prices from all sorts of little things that people say to even the research, you know, that's been done in psychology and behavioral economics and so on that says when you sexualize a market, um, heterosexual male investors are more likely to take risks, you know, when you connect it with sexuality. And there is no way to escape the connection of the domestic slave market with sexuality because 40 to 50 percent of the people who were sold were women of childbearing age who were exposed and were leered at. And, and you know, I mean, you know the story. Right. I mean, it was, but it was, there was no way to pretend like that market wasn't also a market of sexuality. And that, again, was not a bug but a feature for, I think, the majority of the people who participated in it. Thank you. So let's, let's open it up, the, the gentleman here, and then we go there. Yeah, yes, sir. Thank you very much. <coughs> My name is Riley. Yes. And, and if you could identify yourself, and, and we'll try not to have statements, but questions to, yeah. to Dr. Baptiste. Yeah. My name is Riley Temple, Baptiste. class of 74 law. I know it was before you were born. No, um, no. actually not. <laughs> <laughs> My question is, is twofold. Uh, when you were speaking, you talked about the story in the Times mentioning that this was no ordinary sale, and you said that it was. Could I hear your view on whether or not it, the writer could have meant that it was no ordinary sale because it was a sale of, of the church and the role of the church in this particular sale, and that the church was no haven? Secondly, on the issue of reparations, to what extent do you believe or do you countenance the notion that reparations should or could uh, begin and end uh, with money? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Those are great questions. So it was kind of uh, easy to take the language of the New York Times and say, aha, but let's look at it you know, a different way and see the ways in which it was very commonplace and what that tells us. But I think you're absolutely right that, and the article I think um, you know, builds on some uh, really good work uh, that, that has been done here um, to show that Actually, the Catholic Church hierarchy at certain levels was not really very happy about, about this sale, right? Uh, it exposed them or it offended them. You know, it depends on what you want to um, think of as the motives uh, in the Vatican. Uh, but clearly it caused some, uh, some consternation. And you wonder what happened as a result of that in addition to recalling the president you know, you wonder if that had an effect some 25 years later. Right, well, and sending, sending a president who had been born in slavery uh, to become the president of Georgetown. I mean, you'd like to think that that, that was somewhere a part of uh, the Vatican's decision. Um, because my understanding is that the Vatican wanted him to be president. Yeah. Yes, sir. Right there. Oh, yeah. I didn't. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. J just the second me. half of the question. Now, reparations, of course, can't, um, you know, it can't end with money, but I think there's a lot of great social science work that shows that um, the. Um, Although there are certain aspects of racial stigmatization uh, that affect people's life prospects and uh, all kinds of ways that are, are not wiped out by the stigmatized person having lots of wealth, um, there are other things that are lessened, uh, where the effect is, is lessened, uh, and where the 
um, you know, the realities of being able to buy houses and start businesses and pay for education and create new institutions, uh, where this, these open up in the context of our society, which is a capitalist society, which is structured in certain ways, or where access to wealth um, makes a, a huge, huge difference uh, in the life course uh, of individuals and in the life course of, of their descendants. So that, that, I think, has to be a key part of it. Um, there are lots of other components, I suspect, to any definition of reparative justice. Um, and sometimes, you know, the, one of the things that troubles me the most is the idea that um, doing reparative justice, uh, doing acts, uh, reparative acts, um, is going to is going to lead to a sort of sea change in how, you know, the the affected party sees uh, the party who's profited from the historical um, from the historical events. That's not necessarily so. And it, it, and it's especially not necessarily so if that's seen as one of the conditions, one of the, the sort of prescribed outcomes. You know, those, that's, that's the way that forgiveness works. You don't, you don't prescribe it to, if, if you're the guilty party, you don't prescribe it to the forgiver, <laughs> you know. So, anyway. Yeah. But yes, but then, yes, sir. Yes, hi, my name is Bob Eager. I'm a Georgetown Law graduate, 1981, and I'm uh, head of the uh, Own Your History uh, Project nonprofit here in town. Uh, I want to focus on the religious uh, aspect again. Um, I have an ancestor who was from Vermont, educated at what is now Hamilton College, was a Baptist home missionary, was uh, sent to Mississippi in 1841. By 1845, he was pastor of a church near Natchez, where planters attended. I don't, there's no documentation about how, and, and his sons fought for the Confederacy. To me, that's a metaphor of that period. I'd be interested in your uh, thoughts and observations. I have no documentation about what went on in his head, why he, how he was able to make that transition, but it seems to me there's a lot of, it's a kernel of our history. Yeah. Well, I think there's two, two elements, or two ways in which I think it's symbolic of, uh, of some facts of U.S. history that, that we don't necessarily um, like too much, um, but we haven't felt, haven't figured out how to deal with them effectively. The first is that there's lots of Northern involvement in the South, right? Eli Whitney was from the North, and he was one of hundreds, maybe thousands of uh, well-educated New England uh, college grads with little prospects in the pre-industrial revolution, New England, uh, who, and all the pulpits are filled by old guys who are never gonna leave. So what, are they, what can they do? They can go down to the South and teach, teach as private tutors, uh, or maybe set up a small academy, because that's where the money is. That's where the money is in the early 1800s. And it went from that to, uh, a generation later, Northerners moving specifically to become cotton merchants, specifically to become cotton planters or both, which was, you know, pretty common. Uh, and so the, if you look at the bench and bar histories of uh, Mississippi or Alabama, you know, they're full of Northerners who, you know, got thoroughly entrenched in the political, legal, and economic systems. Uh, so, you know, your ancestors' history, I, I think, is, is pretty common. You know, what maybe makes it a little bit different is that he was a Baptist and he came down relatively late, but assimilated, it sounds like, enough to, to get a congregation. And by that point, by the 1840s, some of the denominations are starting to split, right, across a, the issue of slavery. Uh, there, there are a few folks in the convention, at, like the Methodists or something like that, that you know, driving this, but but more broadly, you know, um, it points us to the fact that the South won the War of Interpretation after the Civil War. The War of Interpretation about what North and South meant, uh, and what slavery meant, and whether it was an effective economic system, and was able to present to a large extent the plantation system as as a sort of social control force 
uh, for unruly, um, unequal, perhaps subhuman folks who needed to be uh, in something as close to slavery as possible. And to present that not, you know, that social control system not as designed to extract profit. Oh, no, 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 they were above that. Yeah, and this is, this is a myth which it presses a lot of northern buttons in certain ways too, you know, and, and it has, I think, still continues to do so. Luckily, there's no Calhoun Hall here at Georgetown. Yes, ma'am. Hi, thank Hi. you. I really enjoyed uh, the book. I wanted to ask you, do you think that we as a society here in the United States today are also complicit in the slavery and near slavery that's happening around the world in the same way that you said that many of the whites were complicit in the slavery that was happening then. That's my first question. And second, do you think that this concept of, I think you said efficiency versus morality, but I'll just say profits over morality, is still really governing the day to day, particularly in our international corporations? Um, yes and yes. <laughs> I, I agree on both. Um, there, uh, there's certainly a lot of organizations out there talking about modern day slavery. I think some of them are more effective and accurate than others. Um, we do need to be aware of the distinctions between different kinds of forced labor. They do make a big difference uh, for the people who are trapped in those systems, and they do make a difference in terms of how you might combat those systems. But nonetheless, those systems exist and they're significant, probably because cotton is pretty fully commoditized and traded around, and you know, uh, by the time uh, it enters a factory um, to be turned into thread and then turned into cloth, it could come from anywhere. Odds are pretty good that somebody in here, or maybe all of us, are wearing cotton from Uzbekistan, which is one of the world's largest producers of where it's produced with unfree labor. I wouldn't call it slave labor, but it's child labor. It's a sort of corvée labor. The government goes in and gets all the seventh and eighth graders or somewhere around that uh, to come out and pick cotton until the harvest is done uh, for, the, you know, for the nation, right? Um, and then you have situations which, without the sort of legal structure that the massive, powerful United States, and we're, we've always been taught the U.S. had a small state apparatus, but when you include the apparatus for managing slavery, it's a big, big state, actually. Um, that massive state doesn't exist, for instance, in um, Eastern Congo and Western Rwanda, where, where people are under conditions of forced labor, um, conditions of high violence, um, conditions they're only subject to uh, because they are from other groups, you know, that have been ident identified as vulnerable to, to these, these kinds of forced labor. Um, they're, you know, they're producing this stuff that's in our cell phones and our jewelry and, and so on and so forth. And so, yeah, we're complicit. We are. Um, and we need to find ways to deal with that. We do. Yes, ma'am. Hi, uh, my name is Pamela Escalante. I'm an undergrad at Georgetown. Uh, and this is like a follow-up to the question previously posed. So throughout all of your presentation, which I really look forward to reading your book, I kept thinking about an industry that we're all complicit in because we all eat food, and that is the agricultural industry within the U.S., where just to set some context, the average farm worker, which is a euphemism for produce picker uh, in the U.S., earns, who picks around like in the tomato industry alone, 4,000 pounds a day. Uh, makes $40 a day, so around a penny per pound that he or she picks. Um, also relating to the sexualization, eight out of 10 women who work as farm pickers uh, will experience sexual assault. Uh, you had a call to action here within Georgetown, which I thought was phenomenal. Uh, but this exploitation is still happening in the US today. 
So what mechanisms, what institutions that go beyond policy, because the policy is already in place, like paying somebody $40 a day for a full, more than 12 hours a day of labor is already illegal. Um, and it's not just embedded into the system, it's very obvious that this is happening. There's documentaries around it. What needs to be done to, sort, to end this? Because it happened in 1860, it's happening in 2016. And although they're getting paid, to say that $40 a day for 16 hours of work is far from slavery doesn't seem fair. Yeah. Uh, great, great question. I, I come from a university which is a uh, land grant university, uh, Cornell. It's uh, probably the third that was established with a moral act. Um, it doesn't mean it's one big ag school, um, but even uh, all of it has the mission of doing. Um, doing what we do for the public good. Uh, but that spun out two different ways in terms of the policies that are advocated by different branches of the ag school. You've got one side that's fighting for the farm workers, and you have one side that is very much on the side of agribusiness uh, and seeks not only to you know, find the right chemicals and the right machinery and so on and so forth that will produce a perfectly packable apple, uh, et cetera. Maybe it'll be square soon. <laughs> um, but I bet that would taste great. Uh, but, it, but also fights institutionally against the fight for farm workers. So it's, it is a struggle. What I can, and it's a struggle to get policies implemented that you know, are actual policies. Um, they're on the books, right? But the, the thing we can, the message we can take from this history is that uh, even the actions of the powerful have consequences. I mean, they have really powerful consequences for those uh, whom they exploit, right? Um, and those, those are the folks who get the greatest, take the greatest impact and have the greatest losses. But eventually, the system doesn't work, right? Judgment does show up. Uh, and you, you can look at that religiously or spiritually, or you can look at it uh, in, in, other, you know, in other ways as well, right? The ways in which um, having that much power, treating people as resources out of whom more efficiency has to be extracted all the time, um, leads you to make mistakes, sometimes leads you to become the next, part of the next layer of people who aren't being efficient enough, which I think even in, in the U.S., even some professionals today are experiencing that. Uh, they're not experiencing it in the same way that Charles Thompson did, but it's very destructive to their lives. It's the same, but it's the same machine, the same sort of thought machine, rolling forward, eating every uh, every place of work it can. And, you know, more broadly, uh, you can see this idea that everything is okay if it increases efficiency and the really enthusiastic application of the principle of comparative advantage uh, that the IMF, the World Bank, the WPO, et cetera, that they've implemented um, pretty much by force on a whole host of developing countries, really um, stopping development projects begun in the 50s, and we can argue about whether they were good or whether they were bad, but they were certainly better than what followed, uh, which was forcing countries to open up their entire economies, shrink everything down to, um, uh, virtually all their employment down to low added value labor jobs. Um, and uh, of course, it's hard to be the country uh, that pays its workers the least, right? which means that jobs are always going to be moving to somewhere, to somewhere else, right? So there's a constant, there's a constant struggle um, to extract more wealth uh, and, and more efficiency uh, at a cheaper price from the workers in your country because otherwise these companies will pick up and move. So uh, it's a truly horrific 
idea, and it's a truly horrific uh, set of processes that we're enmeshed in. Yes, sir. My name is Corey Young, and I'm a, a PhD student in the U.S. History, or History Department, U.S. History here at Georgetown. And I was just hoping you could speak more about the demographics of the domestic slave trade that you describe in your book, and more specifically, the desirability of transported children on cotton plantations. Yeah, yeah that's, that's a really good question. Um, so abolitionists criticized and survivors unsurprisingly criticized the great propensity of the domestic slave trade to break up families uh, and send preteens, teenagers, and young people to the really the other side of the country where they'd never see their family members again. And slave owners, you know, um, they tried to justify themselves in various ways. They denied that this was happening, although it was obviously happening. Um, they claimed that, um, you know, they were very reluctant to separate families that were sort of whiter than other families. And uh, the field hands, they didn't really care so much about family attachments. These were the claims that slave owners made. And Louisiana even fairly, fairly early in the game, uh, I think around 1820, passes a law that says children under 10 can't be sold away from their, from their mother. Uh, this, I found lots of cases where that law was violated and, you know, an 11 year old is, you know, um, still pretty young. But again, this is a situation that's, it's depicted as a, a flaw um, by critics of the system and it's something that because they're living in a primarily Protestant Christian nation that has a certain idea of what the ideal household is and it should be this warm, effective place and um, children should not be separated from their mother and so on. Um, because that idea is there, um, slave owners get defensive and that's true. But in the end, this is another thing that's not a bug, it's a feature. Because if you want to um, take people and remove them from traditional systems of labor, they're probably learning how to do from their father, from their uncle or from their older brother. Not just learning how to do the labor, but how to have some control over the labor in the tobacco fields, or cradling grain, or working in a blacksmith shop. Maybe teaching you things the slave owner didn't know. Didn't know you knew, right? Couldn't do himself, right? Um, they were teaching you how to have a little power over the system of production. They take you, the age of 12, let's say, ship you to the other side of the country, put you with a bunch of people you don't know, after you've basically uh, been chained to a whole bunch of other people, some of them much older and more frightening than you. They drop you there on, on this new property uh, and they put you into a new job uh, in which you're constantly measured and you're constantly tortured if you don't meet the measurement. This is part of how the huge increases in cotton productivity are extracted. You know, you do not allow enslaved people to control the labor, to set limits on it. Um, you grab them at a point in the life course where they, they're not capable of that, right? They're not able to do that. Now, over time, they build horizontal relationships. They find fictive kin, you know, uh, whether it's you know, a bunch of guys uh, deciding that they're brothers uh, or somebody, you know, who's older and, and I've run across many cases of this, adopting um, people who remind them of, of his or her own children. And, and they, they struggle. They struggle back towards having some control. And you see this constant struggle, you know, played out in things like rules that say you can't put cotton in someone else's basket. So if you've learned how to pick fast enough and you've got that person you care about in the road next to you, maybe they're not so good, you can put some cotton in their basket, save them from a whipping. The overseer doesn't want that to happen because he wants to know exactly how much you can pick, exactly how much they can pick. They want those relationships to not exist. So there's constant pressure on those relationships. So 
One last one, or shall we, shall we dance? Shall we wrap it up? <laughs> Let me, uh, I think actually, why don't we wrap up, up now? Okay. We continue the conversation afterwards. I, I very much hope we can do that. Um, I just want to thank Professor Baptist. Uh, you began uh, reminding us of that scene in Luke, you know, uh, the prophet going back to his home. And I think you have been a prophetic voice here uh, for us today, uh, helping us see the e e extreme moral gravity of the questions we're dealing with. And they're ones that we knew, but you shed new light on them. And both in your talk and in your words today and in your book, you remind us of the humanity and the lives of each of the enslaved people. And your language reflects that. You often talk about his enslaver, her enslaver, and you tell through their stories. And that's inspired our vision, I think, in an important way here. But equally importantly, you came back down to facts and figures and numbers that we need to contend with. There is a real debt here, one that is measurable in some ways, immeasurable in another. But we need to con confront the measurability, too. And you've named those things in ways that move our conversation forward. Uh, we could not have asked for a better uh, com contribution at this point. So thank you very much thank for being you. with us. Thanks for coming out. I appreciate it. Thank you.